So Annie and I run Ramsey Agriculture. It's based in Tasmania. Uh, we have two properties. The main property is Ratho at Bothell, and we have another property about three hours away on the northeast of Tassie, and it runs 4,500 composite ewes and is a, is a breeding operation only. Through the challenge, we focused on Ratho, um, and it's, it's our main, main property. It's about 1,000 hectares of productive ground, and over 50% of this is irrigated. In our irrigation, our pinnacle crop is the poppies, and we do everything we do, can to make them the best. Um, so poppies you can only grow one year in three, so in the, in the two years outside that, uh, at the moment we're running, running ewes. Uh, we're trying a bit of clover seed, but we're, we're joining about 5,000 ewes. We plan to finish about 8,000 lambs this year, and we did that last year, and we trade cattle opportunistically. So this is a photo of our, our property. It's pretty flat, it's arable, it's suited to irrigation and, and um, it's one of our, our linear irrigators. So our vision is to be a highly profitable business that Im improves the environment, giving its stakeholders a balanced, happy and contented life and options into the future. Our goals are listed. Our main goal is to have a profitable farm. I'm quite a financially focused person. Uh, however, also because of our debt levels, we need to really focus on profit and make it a number one goal. Greater than 5%, then you know, it, it gives us options to look at other things. We want to decrease our exposure to debt uh, through uh, land acquisition and, and succession. We, we've got a quite a high debt burden. We want to maintain a balanced lifestyle. I'm not an atypical farmer that works seven days a week, dawn to dusk. I want to have time with the family and make the farm a vehicle to meet my goals rather than working for the farm all the time. We want to farm with best practice. We want to improve our viability and we want to improve our environmental sustainability. So why do we do the MLA challenge? Well, the story starts probably when I came back from Orange Ag College in 2001. We had the opportunity to purchase our farm that we were leasing. And the whole Clyde Valley was turning from uh, merino sheep. We, we were merino sheep growers, around about 3,000 ewes. Um, the whole Clyde Valley was changing into poppies. We had arable land, we had a water resource. It was a bit of a no-brainer. So we followed suit. We bought the farm, we started to develop it. And it worked really well. Uh, we got excellent poppy results. In between the years of poppies, we grew cereal crops, and they worked well too. Um, we are meeting our goals, we are making a good return, and everything was going swimmingly. It coincided, though, with fresh ground, so you know, we hadn't mined our, our environmental capital, and also probably a run of dry years. In 2010, the system came crashing down, and so did our profits. Uh, when the rains returned, we got back to probably what was normal years. Uh, we're farming on really fragile, probably about uh, 10 inches of topsoil, and it's, it's, it's highly fragile soil. So our poppy yields uh, suffered, and so did our profit. So we looked at what we could do. We, we got a caring for our country grant for our, our, our valley, and because a lot of farmers were experiencing the same problem, got some experts in, and they said, You've got to give your grey poppies, but in between, grow ryegrass. Ryegrass is good for organic carbon, but also it's really good for ameliorating uh, your soil. It, it actually aggregates soil particles, which will help with your drainage and, and help with your poppies. So we did. So we put in, put in ryegrass and uh, we did a terrible job of it. We tried to run merino sheep on the ryegrass uh, and we made a heap of hay and we made no money again. So we saw the MLA challenge and we thought, well, this, you know, this could really help us improve the grazing side of our business. The challenge gave us uh, various tools and resources. Some of the key tools or resources was they gave us a mentor. My mentor was John Keelor, a composite stud breeder from Victoria. Excellent guy who knew a lot about composite sheep and, and set us on the right track. Um, it also gave us a farm advisor, Sam Newson, who gave a really good overarching picture on, on the farm and particularly the people side of the business, which we didn't expect to get out of the challenge. Um, and it also, MLA gave a heap of tools and resources, a lot of research, a lot of uh, online stuff that was really important to our business progression. So just some key lessons learnt from the mentor and research. We probably all know it, but a key profit driver in, in a meat enterprise is kilograms of meat per hectare. I had a paradigm that we had irrigated country, we had no um, shelter on the farm, we couldn't breed on our country, so we had to be a finishing operation. Whereas the mentor, John Keeler, really pointed out that He's seen plenty of farms like ours, and the best way to utilise your spring flush is a breeding system. So we went into a breeding system. In a breeding system, key profit drivers, lambing percent, 
Um, and key to that's the time of lambing, your feed on offer. Um, but probably what we were missing a bit was the size of the lamb born. To to, for a little lamb to ex survive exposure in our country, you, uh, well, you need a bigger lamb. To get a bigger lamb, you need a bigger ewe. You can't get a big lamb out of a fine wool merino ewe, is what we had. And also, you need to select your genetics, get your ASBVs for a, a bigger lamb. So this is a photo of our an irrigator, and you know, no shield at all, and there's some little lambs. It's not a great photo, but yeah, the, the only shield really is the grass and the irrigator. So what prompted the change from Reno to Crossfit? I need to point out it was a pretty tough decision to make. We had a long history of breeding. My father was a passionate wool grower, so it was a real people issue there. Annie and I are much more pragmatic. We have a real belief in keeping things simple. In the end, it just came down to horses for courses. We changed our farm to irrigation, uh, and the crossbreeds were much better, better suited. But the other key was having the mentor and having the farm advisor holding our hand to say, yeah, John, Annie, you're doing the right thing, uh, really helped. It, it gave us confidence. So again, a photo. This is not last spring, but probably previous two springs. We just grew all this grass and merinos didn't do very well on it, crossbreds did. And this year, we, we didn't have anything like that because the crossbreds were able to eat the, eat the feed in front of them. I was asked at one of these talks, so what gross margins were you getting on your merinos compared to your, your crossbreds? And I didn't know. We actually didn't research that or budget that. It was, it was almost a no-brainer to just change, make that change in the crossbreds. But I thought, well, I'd better go and have a look. Now, a lot of benchmarking will say that a a merino ewe joined a prime lamb size is the most profitable, and I won't disagree with that. But if you break it down, it comes down to lambing percentage, and you need about 30% more lambs on the ground in a meat enterprise to cover the costs of the loss of fleece income. Our merinos were doing 66%, the crossbreds last year did 137%, so it just, it's a much better gross margin. However, the, gross, the crossbreds, just for interest, is about $500 a hectare, that's based on average lamb price, so current lamb price is probably about 20% of that. And interest in Caroline that you're still tipping a good forecast for the lamb, so our gross margin will probably be about 20% higher than that per hectare. Whereas our cereal cropping is around $800 a hectare, so our sheep aren't quite as good as our cropping, but the key and the pinnacle to our business is the poppies, and we can range from 1,000 to 5,000. To get up to the 5,000, we need the sheep. Another tool that the, uh, we used a lot was uh, and developed by CSRO and MLA was the feed demand calculator. I won't go into this too much, but uh, for anyone looking at changing direction like we had, I wish we had to use this tool when we first made the change. It's great for planning, uh, it's great for scenario analysis, and it's really simple to use. I'll just quickly go through. This is a chart here. Down the bottom is, is your, your, uh, your sheep, your stock numbers, and what they eat per month, and then your green line is your pasture grown per month, and the top white line is your accumulated pasture grown per month. And it just shows we're in the September, October, November, we're still not eating our feed, come to a pinch in January, February, and winter, typical scenario in Southern Australia. So just a quick summary of the changes that we made through the challenge and, and, and the years ahead. We we're cropping around about 600 hectares, continually cropping, and, and we've dropped that down to about 200. We made about 3,000 bales of hay a year. Last year we didn't make any, and I was really happy because I don't think it's a great uh, enterprise to be part of. Changed our ewe type from merinos to crossbreds. We've increased our ewe numbers. Pro when we were cropping, we only had about 1,000 ewes, and now we've got 5,000. Lambing percentage has increased, as I talked about. We've also increased our lamb turnoff quite considerably. When I talked to the mentor about uh, Going to a breeding system, we thought we'd be breeding all these lambs, 5,000 ewes, 137 per cent, that's 8,000 lambs. We're not going to be able to finish that many. We thought we'd be heading to a store lamb system. However, this, the challenge made us focus on everything we did, and, and we put a focus on, on lamb weight gain, and we, by managing to focus and making sure that we we're doing the best job we could on those lambs, uh, we managed to turn all of them off as finished lambs. But also, the second cross lamb finishes about 30 per cent quicker than a first cross lamb, so that also helped as well. We didn't want to just focus on production. Our biggest cost in our business is labour. We wanted to focus on our costs, so we had a labour efficiency KPI. Uh, and we managed to improve that from about 6,000 to 8,000 DEC per full-time equivalent. Uh, and we did it really simply through changing systems. Previous to the challenge, we had three lambing dates, we had three sheep enterprises. It was a bit messy. We just simplified everything, uh, one lambing date, one type of sheep, and that's, that's how we made those changes. We've got more changes. More efficiencies to be had through equipment, yards and laneways. 
But the end goal is to increase our return on assets. Last year, we did increase our return on assets. We didn't uh, quite hit the 5%, but this year, I reckon we will be. So are we on course to meet our vision? Poppies are fickle. Uh, we thought we had a good poppy year this year, however, for numerous reasons they didn't come about, and uh, th they're a tough enterprise to be part of. High risk, high reward. Whereas sheep prices this year for us are great. We produced a lot of meat, um, and yeah, and the prices are so helping. So we, we, we reckon we'll be on course to meet that, that goal of 5%. Our environmental sustainability is much better with the grass system. I really like what we're doing. I think there's a, it, it's a much better fit and a much more robust system. Uh, our life's balanced, but we'd be more balanced if we had better fences. Crossbreds are pretty tough on your, on your fences. So what are our challenges ahead? We run a high input system. We put on urea, irrigation. It's expensive. So we've got to make sure that everything we're doing uh, we, we do it well, we've got to have attention to detail, but also we've got to keep an eye on our costs and, and, and a cost margin analysis to make sure that you know, if we're putting the expense out there, we've got to be getting the reward at the end uh, of the day. As with every, any change, uh, this throws up some challenges, so these crossbreds are having trouble with casting. Major twin lamb disease issue last year. Uh, we've got employed a livestock consultant to help us with these issues and we're just working through these as we speak and we think we got some strategies to, to overcome those issues. And just in January this year, we had some suboptimum growth rates, and again, we, we're using a few strategies to um, improve that. I'll just go, quickly go through some pros and cons of, of the crossbred versus the merinos, as I see it. Uh, pros of crossbreds, they convert long green grass well. Um, yeah, our, our merinos were getting foot rot and worms, and, and they just weren't converting that grass into meat, whereas the, the crossbreds are much better and genetically suited to do that. Uh, I've mentioned that, they don't get furrow, they don't get much many worms. The lambs ex survive exposure better, they finish quicker, they carry the condition on their back, so we often found with the merinos, um, coming out of the spring they were only condition score two, probably two and a half, and come joining, you'd have to give them a heap of grain to get them back into the right condition score for joining. Whereas these crossbreds are coming out of the spring on that sort of feed, a condition score for no grain feeding, they carry it through, they join well, they scan well, and they carry it through the winter well too. Also, another benefit I, I didn't realise that uh, their different grazing habit to merinos, they'll go into a paddock and clean it out and, and do a really good job on, with our rotational grazing in, uh, in, in, in reducing the overburn but also pushing into some other country that, uh, that the merinos never would. Uh, the cons. They do eat a lot, you know, they've got much higher, higher DC per head, um, they get cast on the back. Major infrastructure is needed when you make that change. They, they, they're hard on fences, they're hard on yards. They have high production issues because they're produ so, producing so many, so many lambs, you know, we, we had the hypocalcemia issues. Um, obviously it's, it's about horses for courses and whatever's best for your farm. So these are my two boys, Henry and Alex and some rams we purchased last year. Um, they're the future, and I just want to say yeah, our, our story is about some pretty major changes in one year through the MLA challenge, and, and prior to the challenge, Annie and I were pr probably not in a very happy place. We were pretty despondent, we weren't meeting our goals, and we were, we were feeling pretty lost. Uh, but within one year, we've really turned it around, and, and with some good people, some good help, some good tools and resources, we feel so much more positive about our, our future ahead.